Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I'm thrilled that you're listening today. This is another episode. <laughs> I feel like there's so many when you do two a week. I am a registered holistic nutritionist and women's health biohacker and advocate and educator. And I'm just thankful that you are listening to today's episode. So if you are new here, I put out episodes every Tuesday and Friday. And I also do a feature that I like to call the DM, DM of the day or DM of the week. And I'm going to read this one to you. I actually just added this to my website because it's great. So this woman wrote in to me, she did my fertility and preconception health course, which is all about optimizing your health before you get pregnant for men and for women. When I was going through that journey myself, I looked around and really didn't see much. I didn't see a lot of people talking about this. And I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, but I really just wanted to optimize my health so that I could reduce any fertility struggles, have a healthier pregnancy and a healthier baby and everything like that. And also help my husband be healthier as well. And it totally worked. So that's why my course Baby Steps has become so successful. And we have lots of members in there is because it breaks down exactly what to do every single day for 90 days in order to optimize your health. Now, sometimes I get some well, sometimes I love to get these reviews of members in the course. And this woman wrote in, she said, hi, Brittany, I just wanted to send you a quick message to express my heartfelt thanks for creating your course. After a year of unsuccessful attempts and constant disappointment, your course was a beacon of hope. The weekly modules were not only informative, but truly transformative. Your detailed guidance on nutrition and the specific supplements for women really made a difference for me. Your personal story made me feel less alone in my struggles. I especially found the hydration tips to be a game changer for my overall well-being. I followed the 90-day protocol diligently and am overjoyed to report that I am now pregnant. This course was a game changer for me and I cannot thank you enough. Keep up the incredible work. Oh, I just love that. Just literally like warms my heart. Thank you so much for this and positive feedback. We love that. I'm here to help you get pregnant. You know, that's what I want to do. So it's really just reassuring when I see people write in like this. So if that's you, if you're somebody who is like, hey, I want to get pregnant in the next year, trust, I can help you. And there's actually so much you can do. Don't buy into this narrative of like, oh, we'll just try for a year. And if it doesn't work, we'll do IVF. Please don't do that. There's so much you can do to take control and responsibility so that you can actually be as healthy as possible, like, and, you know, reduce those odds and increase your ability to get pregnant and, and also stay pregnant as well. So there's a lot there. I have a lot of podcast episodes on that. If you want to listen to it, go for it. What I like to do (laughs) for all of my people in my community, whether you are on social media or on my podcast as a listener, I have a private link that I send to people that actually has the course at a discount. So the way that you can get that is by messaging me on Instagram and I will send it to you. It's not public. It's not, it's not on my website. It's not promoted anywhere. It's just for these, the people who I know consume my content and are like, yeah, this is for me. And so I love to just reward you and like, I don't know, make you, make it easier for you essentially. So that is for you. Now, today's podcast episode is all about bodybuilding and competing in that space as a woman. And then also a lot about body image issues and eating disorders. So this was a really interesting podcast episode. I'm not somebody who knows a lot about bodybuilding. You know, it's not really my forte. It's not the circles that I run in. But when we talk about body image issues and eating disorders and and things like that, like that definitely crosses into the biohacking and wellness space. And I see it a lot in different people, different companies, when I go to conferences, things like that. Like I see it a lot. So this was really interesting. We talked about body dysmorphia. We talked about 
just the struggles of, you know, you're changing body on your mental health and all of these different things that are like sticky topics, honestly, like they're sticky topics. And so it was a really like eye-opening conversation. And I think you're going to get a lot out of it, especially if you're somebody who has ever felt like that, you know, you've ever felt like you're not happy with how you look and, and the way you see yourself is different from how other people see you. And yeah, that whole narrative. So that's what we really dive deep into today. So I think this is going to be for you if you can relate. And honestly, I think most people can. So enjoy this podcast episode. A shout out to Qualia. Qualia Life makes this Synaletic product. It's a supplement. You actually only need it two days a week. And essentially what it does is it helps to clean up your senescent cells. Senescent cells are kind of like the old cells that don't really go away and they take up space for all the healthy cells. And so as we age, we actually get more and more of these senescent cells accumulate in the body. And so the question becomes like, how do we get rid of them? Like, what can we take to help to like sweep them out, sweep out the cobwebs, make room for the new type of idea? And that's where you get senolytic, qualia senolytic comes in one of the only products that actually does this, to be honest. And so some of the ingredients in it, because I know a couple of people asked me the other day, so it's got things in it like fisetin, quercetin. It also has uh, synactive in it, uh, things like olive leaf extract, some the milk thistle fruit extract, things like that. So you can find that like full distri- description on qualialife.com slash Brittany. And if you use my discount code, Brittany, you get a nice, it's a really nice discount <laughs> that they gave my audience. So check that out. I love this product. Again, like I said, you only need it two days a week. So it works really well with me. I, that's my type of product. And a shout out to Glycanage. Speaking of aging, if you are somebody who wants to get your biological age tested, on a cellular level, and you're actually ready for the results. <laughs> Glycan age is what you want to do. It takes a look at the inflammation in your body and it will spit out an age that it thinks you are by measuring your glycans. So when I first did this, my result was really high and I was really upset. <laughs> so take it with a grain of salt if your result comes back really high, okay? There is a lot that you can do to reduce this. At the time, I think I was too much into like intermittent fasting, cold plunging, very stressed with work. Like I was working a full-time job and I was running my business full-time. And so I was stretched to, you know, whatever ends possible. So it really does reflect your lifestyle and your nutrition and you can't really escape it. So it's good. It, I am very happy that I did it. And then I did it again and it was better. So, you know. It got better. One of the best things about Glycan Age is when you do this test, it actually includes a consultation with one of their healthcare practitioners. So you actually get to talk to somebody about this and they will say, okay, I think that this is why your result is this, right? So they'll say, okay, I think it's your, you know, you're not getting outside enough or you're not exercising enough or whatever it might be. So I really recommend people do this test, don't guess. I love to say, get some data on yourself so that you can actually know what's going on. Use my discount code biohackingbrittany and you will be able to save as always. I love glycan age. I think it's one of the best ways to test your biological age. So I definitely recommend it. Enjoy this podcast episode and I will catch you very soon for another one. Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. I am thrilled that you are listening today. I have a very special guest joining me, a fellow Canadian. Her name is Ashlyn Gunderson. She is out in Alberta, which I actually just recently drove through, which is very interesting. And she is the co-owner of Perfect Fit for You and a powerhouse in the fitness industry. She has a background in biochemistry and a successful career in bodybuilding. She's also a mom of two, which we're definitely going to dive into. And she combines her scientific knowledge with practical experience to help her clients achieve their best. So we're going to dive into bodybuilding, fitness, body image, and everything like that. So Ashlyn, welcome to the show. Hi, Brittany. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here. So I 
always try to get my guests to kind of start with their beginning of their health journey. So for you, like, what did that look like, you know, even before the bodybuilding? Like, how did you first start thinking, okay, I actually want to be like healthier than I am? Fair. I mean, luckily for me, I grew up in a household where that was a priority from honestly birth. My mom was a bodybuilder when I was growing up as a kid. And so given everyone has a different opinion on bodybuilding, but in my family, it was actually a very positive experience for me. I do have two sisters and a brother who grew up in the same household who didn't maybe have that exact same experience. It didn't make them fall in love with fitness. But for myself, seeing my mom train and stretch and eat and go on stage in a sparkly bikini, like to me, that was a connection point for me in order to like create a better relationship with my mom. So that made me start at the gym when I was like a teenager. I'd beg my mom, like, please pay for a drop in pass for me. Let me come. And like, even as a kid, I grew up in the freaking gym daycare. Like I remember being three or four and my mom saying to me, like, give mom an hour and I'll be a better mom. And like, here we are 30 years later and that's me to my children now. And so it wasn't like I had a big transformation journey. Like I grew up in that. And then I was a college volleyball athlete. And after college volleyball, I kind of was in limbo in terms of like, oh, where can I be competitive with fitness? Or like, what, where can I dabble in? What's my next thing? What can I train for? And that's when I was like 18 years old, I started competing in bodybuilding competitions myself. Wow. Wow. That's such a cool upbringing and so unique. I don't know. I don't think I know anybody whose parents were bodybuilders and grew up in that kind of world. But I love that saying of like, give mom an hour and, you know, she'll be able to give it to you multiplied exponentially. You know, you know, it's all just about that little, uh, little self care that can really go a long way when we like put our oxygen mask on first. A hundred percent. That's not always fitness for some people, but in my life now and my life growing up, that's what it was. It was, that was the hour that we spend on ourselves. Although I think obviously people have different ways. If you make that hour for yourself, whether you're gardening or playing guitar or sitting in the bath on your phone, whatever it is, like make that hour for yourself and you will be a better mom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were in the bodybuilding world, what did that kind of look like for you? Like, was it super successful and super positive the whole time? Like kind of take us through your journey of actually starting to compete at such a young age. Oh, well, this is exciting to talk about because for the last handful of years, I've been a coach in this industry. So I'm always talking about other clients and how they're doing. And so when someone reflects on my journey, I'm like, oh, this is exciting. So I did my first show when I was 18 years old. And essentially, I did 16 bodybuilding competitions between the ages of 18 and 28. So quite extensively competing. There are points in competing where like, yeah, it's all about health and longevity for a small portion of time. And then there becomes a level where it's like kind of unhealthy. And that's just what it is. You're at an unhealthy body fat percentage for an extended period of time. Those do have health consequences. And so in my later 20s, I had fertility issues. I had female athlete triad. I had lost my period for almost a decade, had a hard time getting pregnant, had two miscarriages before I got pregnant and had a successful pregnancy. So I do believe a lot of those repercussions were from the aesthetic look of being a bodybuilder for an extended period of time in my early 20s. And then I kind of started coaching people. So I went to school to actually be a pharmacist. So I have a, like you said at the beginning of this, a biochemistry background. I have a chemistry degree. And then I started making money off my passion and ended up pursuing that. And now I've been in business as a health and fitness coach for over a decade. Wow. So yeah. Yeah been a lot of health and fitness the last 12 years. Through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I love that you talk about like the actual struggle side of it. Cause I think just from my perspective, like looking from the outside in, all I kind of see is the things that are posted on Instagram or social media of these really ripped people, really toned, beautiful people in like bikinis, whatever they're wearing. And it, especially when I was younger, not so much now, but you know, when you're younger, you kind of look at like, look at that and you're like, oh, I wish I could look like that. Or, oh, I like this part of this body or that type of thing. And it becomes so fixated on the body image and the specific parts of the body and what it can look like. And I don't really see a lot of people talking about like, hey, there's actually like a darker side to it and how that impacts your health and maybe even your mental health as well. Sure. Yes. And like, I just touched kind of on the physical standpoint of like, hey, low body fat percentages, these are the repercussions of that. Obviously, there's mental health repercussions of that as well. 
luckily for me, I can say like, I came out unscathed. I didn't have an eating disorder. And like, that shouldn't be something to celebrate when it's supposed to be about a sport. But at the end of the day, there is always the people that struggle with that when they're in that process. The process of being a bodybuilder or getting on stage is a recipe for disordered eating habits. And it's a red flag for a ton of body image issues. Absolutely. There's the flip side to that, though. And the caveat is, it also builds a ton of confidence in people, it creates organization and discipline and determination. And, you know, as with most things, it's not black and white. But there's a lot there's a lot of different ways that people can come out of a process like that. And it's not always positive. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. Did you ever think about or like talk to or see this in your clients, like the idea of body dysmorphia, where like, you know, and for people who don't know what that is, it's kind of like this idea of the way that you see yourself in the mirror is very different than actually what is reality. And it can actually be prevalent in men and women. And it can be on both sides of the spectrum. Like you can see yourself as someone who is bigger than you actually are or smaller than you actually are or things like that. And it's, it really can mess with your brain if you're not aware of that even existing. A hundred percent. And so, of course, being a competition prep coach, two weeks ago, I had 14 bikini athletes compete. So this has been prominent <laughs> the last two weeks of like, even even the last two weeks, the girls just get off diuretics. You even just get off diuretics and your body shifts and changes. You eat some salt, you eat some sugar, your body's going to fluctuate, you know, a decent amount to the point of like, oh my gosh, I must have reversed everything I did the last five months. I don't even look like a bikini athlete anymore. And it's been 10 days. And they truly because it is body dysmorphia, but in the same breath, like the body does wax and wane and change a lot, especially when someone's trying to peak their physique in that aesthetic fashion right at the end of their competition. Yeah, man, that's so granular. Like just to think about that in such a short period of time. So what do you tell your clients who you can see are like struggling, who are saying the things that you're like, oh, this is a red flag. I think you might have body dysmorphia. Like what does that conversation look like? I mean, because of the industry I'm in, I do remind people that although it's not normal to feel that way, it is common. A lot of people feel that way after they compete. And a lot of times it takes just as long as you went into this competition to come out of it. So people think I'm going to train, I'm going to eat, I'm going to diet, I'm going to spray tan, I'm going to do all the things five months straight. And then a week later, I should just be able to maintain all of that, but not have all of those same habits. And, and that's just not the case. For myself personally, it takes five or six months to shift my brain back to homeostasis as my body also is shifting back to homeostasis. Our brain is plastic. That is amazing. We have neuroplasticity. It saves lives. But it also, when you're totally consumed over what am I training today? What am I eating today? Am I body checking today? I have to send pictures to my coach today. Do I look better to the girl that was standing next to me last year today? You know, you're looking at these things. Your brain is creating those thought processes and those habits. And when your show is over, it's hard to just say, I'm not going to think about what I'm eating today or how I'm training today or how my body looks compared to somebody else's today because you've created that thought process. And so it takes some time to unwind those thoughts. Yeah, that makes sense. That must be so difficult or interesting on your part when you have clients who send you photos and you have to like critique their bodies. Like mm -hmm. yes. that's hard. Like how do you, how do, what is the verbiage that you use for that when you don't want to be the trigger for these like serious mental health issues? So <laughs> I'm like, I could go way back on this, but the majority of my client base never would step on stage. So I always like people to understand that. Like this is probably 10% of what I do, but it's sexy and people like to watch it and it draws attention. And honestly, it, it draws people to my business, right? In general, even if people don't ever want to step on stage. So I like to segregate that the majority of my clients, I'm not body checking them like that. We are celebrating the wins. We are celebrating the postmenopausal woman who can go to the park and chase after her grandkids. I love that shit. That's the stuff that I love. Lifestyle, nutrition. But this is the sexy piece. This is the extremism piece. This is, I have to coach these people different than I would coach the average Joe because people are paying money to look at them. So they shouldn't look like the girl at the grocery store and they shouldn't look like the other ladies at the beach. They have to stand out, meaning they have to have habits and discipline that stand out, that are above ordinary. It's not just about, okay, well, I went to the gym three days this week. I want to look like that lady. These people are doing quite extreme things. So they do need that consistent reassurance, that constant checking on. And I mean, my verbiage is gentle. But it's still disciplinary in a sense because it takes some authority and some like 
you know, coaching to get people to that level. It's not easy. And so they do need a coach who's going to be a little bit on their ass. But I, I like to think that over the course of the last decade, I've become a little bit better at the way I word those things and how I make sure we're still on track. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That definitely makes sense in terms of like how you talk about it and the different types of clients that you see. I love that you almost like focus on not lifestyle, but being able to be fit enough to enjoy a better lifestyle for a majority, right? It's not just about competitions. It's like running around with your grandkids or like maybe being fertile and getting a regular cycle and like losing weight for that. Or maybe you have to gain weight for that. Like, the, you know, there's a really like a sweet spot for weight and fertility. And so I just find that so interesting. Have you seen trends in the last few years that have changed because you've been doing this for so long? Like, have you seen not necessarily body trends, but anything that's like come up more and more that you're like, oh, this is where we are now in this fitness industry? Oh, God, yeah. So back when I competed, you know, when I started competing, I was 18, 19 years old. There was only like one place to really compete. Everyone showed up. We did our best. And you were mostly as a bikini athlete, drug free. Like people weren't expecting that these bikini girls were on performance enhancing drugs or steroids. Now, now you have to seek out drug tested events. Like this event we went to last weekend, every single girl had to be polygraphed before they could step on stage. They had to be polygraphed to make sure that they were drug free for the last 10 years. So there is now drug free federations that urine test, that polygraph test to segregate the difference because of how prominent and dominant peed use is now. In my opinion, I've just seen it exasperated in the last, I don't know, five to six years. The fact of like a, a girl who's not using drugs to show up at an event that is not drug, drug tested, very rare now. Very rare for them to be able to even stand their ground and to look anywhere resembling other girls on stage. Have you heard about Synalytics yet? It's a class of ingredients discovered less than 10 years ago, and they're being called the biggest discovery of our time for promoting healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. Your life goals in your career and beyond require productivity. Let's be honest. The aging process, however, is not our friend when it comes to endless energy and productivity. And that's why I use Qualia Synalytic. If someone had told me that there are science-backed ingredients that could help me feel 15 years younger in a matter of months, I would not have believed it until I tried this. As we age, everyone accumulates these senescent cells in our bodies. They're also kind of known as zombie cells. They are old and worn out and not serving a useful function for our health anymore, but they're taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. Much like getting rid of dead leaves off of a plant, qualia synolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow for the rest of them to thrive in the body. The best part is you actually only need to take it two days a month. When I have taken this, I've had higher energy levels. I have been more productive, felt more enthusiastic in life, and also had less aches and pains. So resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Synalytic right now. Go to qualialife.com slash Brittany for up to 50% off, which is wild. And use code Brittany at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's qualia, spelled Q-U-A-L-I-A, life.com slash Brittany for an extra 15% off of your purchase. Thanks to Qualia for sponsoring today's episode, and I will definitely be taking my share this month. Wow. That's honestly, I'm really shocked by that. Like I, I mean... You know, I guess you hear these things and you think, oh yeah, like the men are using steroids and they're using these different things. And that's like the common way we talk about it. But to think about women using those is scary. And I have a part of my course about this, like I have a fertility course, but I'm curious, like what have you seen maybe personally with your clients if they were on it before or anything like that? Like what are the health repercussions of women who choose to use those substances? I mean, personally speaking, I've had people come to me because, of course, I, I have a biochemistry background. I work in the bodybuilding industry. I feel like I'd be a great coach for someone who's utilizing peds. Unfortunately, that's just that's just not me. I don't want to, one, put someone in that position when I don't... There's, there's not a ton of research to show, like, this is the perfect way to use these drugs, right? 
And, and I just don't want to put my stamp on that. So I haven't had athletes who are actively using steroids, at least none that have exposed that information to me, whether they're lifestyle clients or otherwise, it's just not something that I dabble in. So I personally haven't seen the repercussions in my business, but I have seen the repercussions online. I've seen the repercussions of women telling their stories. I've seen the repercussions of women not being able to have children, of having that really deep voice for the rest of their life and it not going away. The really strong jaw, the skin, the like the ovaries that then I'm like, I don't know how much detail you want here, but like when a woman is taking, say, testosterone or they take a strong steroid that needs to increase their like androgen hormones, the ovaries want to become testes. So they put a lot of pressure on the woman's like clit and it comes down and it creates like a mess down there a little bit. You know, I don't know how to verbalize that as to not like insult anybody, but these are the repercussions that do happen. So it's something that people should be aware of. Yeah, it's it's pretty significant because you're really playing with the delicate balance of women's hormones, which already are so susceptible to so many different things and toxins and food and and fitness and all sorts of things in our environment that can impact them. And then to throw like anabolic steroids at them is, or non-anabolic is like really scary. And so just to think about like trying to get that balance to come back in the future is, I would be very concerned. And like, yeah, I don't know a lot about like bringing that all back into harmony, but I feel like it would take a lot of work. I have a hard enough time reverse dieting people back who haven't used steroids. <laughs> Just from like, okay, now we're getting off diuretics. Now we're decreasing your like list based zone two steady state cardio because it's not metabolically friendly right now. You've done a lot of it. Now let's push your calories from being in a calorie deficit and move you to maintenance. Let's fill you with more nutrient dense whole grain foods, more fiber, you know, those types of things. That's already a process not mind adding the whole component of performance enhancing drugs to the mix. And you want to talk body dysmorphia, put someone on performance enhancing drugs, they do not see the drastic change that other people who are looking at you from a subjective perspective are going to see in such a short period of time either. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I I can imagine. I can imagine how like, uh, almost like addictive it is. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah, I've kind of been there, like not nearly to the extremes. Like, so I really cannot relate. But just this idea of like, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when my waist is this small or my biceps are this big or whatever it is. And it's so funny because like, it's not so funny, but every time you reach that little milestone or goal, like you just push the goal further. Like you just change the goalpost because then it becomes like, oh yeah, like now I want to be this over here and I want that. And it's addictive and it's really, really toxic way of thinking. And it's, yeah, especially when I was a bit younger, I can totally relate to those like circling thoughts. And they say like dopamine isn't about achieving something or having something in the moment. It's about what's next. And so if you're getting that hit of dopamine from chasing a goal, you're probably not going to revel in it for very long before you ask the question of like, what's next for me? The carrot is moving. And sometimes I think that's a fantastic thing in life. I think it's great when people are like, what next can I do? What's next for me? But it's sad in a way when you work so hard for something and there isn't some moment of like reassurance and acceptance of like, I freaking did that. And so as a coach, I do like to remind people like, hey, let's stop. Let's be present. Let's revel in this moment for a little bit. And let's be so happy with what we've achieved up to this point. And then we can focus on what's next. Yeah, I love that. That's such a good life lesson in general. And I definitely have moments where I forget that. Even in my business, like the idea of celebrating small wins is just like, you know, you get a great email or you get a great client or whatever, and then you feel good. And then something comes through and it's negative or, or then you have the next challenge and you just kind of forget it. You know what I mean? And, and it's really hard and takes a lot of practice to focus on the positive and the good because our brains love to focus on the negative and the hard, like the, you know, how many compliments do you remember in your life versus how many digs or criticisms do you remember? Right. And it's, it's so sad that we're kind of like, you know, made to be like that for whatever reason. Maybe it's because we have a stronger emotional response to it. I don't know. I mean, like, as we're on the topic of bodybuilding and body dysmorphia and goals, like, uh, they give you feedback, right? When you're up there, kind of tell you, oh, this is how you could look better. This is how you could improve. And like, at 20 years old, I was told, like, you're insymmetrical in your chest. You're insymmetrical in your chest. I'm like, 
Okay, so basically they were saying I needed implants, right? Like I had broad shoulders, a tiny waist and a very flat chest. So they said, okay, you do way better in the sport. Basically, if you got implants. So what did I do? I saved $12,000 at 20 years old and went and got implants. I had them for 11 months before I got them explanted because I absolutely hated them. But it was like, whatever they say, I need to modify and change myself to better suit this subjective perspective. And that was a huge realization factor for me. Of like, I didn't need those boobs for the 30 seconds I'm going to stand on stage in a year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's such a young age. But you know what? Like that, it honestly makes sense because that age, you're so malleable. Like you're so, like you can be influenced by anyone saying anything and you will go to drastic extremes of like, you know, getting breast implants and saving all your money for it to only now obviously look back and you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And you know, you know better now, but it's hard. And like, I guess, what would you say for those women and men potentially listening who are maybe in like their early twenties who are trying to either like become a bodybuilder and like become as ripped as they can be, or have like faced this criticism and are trying to make these drastic changes? Like, how do you encourage them? Honestly, I I feel like we're talking about the negatives of this because that's obviously the easy way to talk about it. But there's so many positives. So the funny thing is, if someone was saying, I want to pursue this, I would encourage it still. Because like I said before, the organization, the discipline, the fact that like these people are 21, 22 years old, they're not drinking, they're not doing drugs, they're probably going to bed early, they're stretching, they're working on their mobility, they're probably doing their cold showers, their breath work, their meditation, all the things like the personal development, like there's so much more to that process than just saying, oh, this person now they want to diet and like work out really hard so they can look a certain way. And so I wouldn't give too many like, I would give the fair warning of like, yes, the body dysmorphia can result. And yes, competing and being compared is obviously really hard mentally. But there's also so many positives to that process that I think really encourages some character building at that age as well. And so I wouldn't just put a dark cloud over it. Although this last weekend, I saw that they created a new class at this show. So there's like fitness categories and wellness categories and bodybuilding and figure and People see my girls, I train bikini athletes majority, but they came out with a junior bikini category, which is for girls under 18. That's not something I'll dabble in. That's not something that I'm like, oh, I think that's a fantastic idea. I mean, let the girl be a gymnast or a dancer or, you know, do other co-curricular sports. Once she's 18, maybe let's have that conversation. But even 18 is really freaking young. Wow, junior. So what like what age is that? Is that just like 16, 17 year olds? Or are we talking like younger? I'm guessing 16 to 18 is I think what the limit was. This is the first time I've seen it. And I was like, eh, don't really think that as a coach, I'll be bringing in athletes in that category. Just personal opinion. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, yeah, I think that's a good call on your, on your part. And yeah, I mean, whew, 16 is even like, yeah, younger. You're not even like an adult yet. And like you're in high school. And mean though, like I've had girls that have competed there like 18, 19, still even hard at that age. And even for myself, like I asked some of my athletes this year on my team out of the 14 athletes, four of them were in their 50s. And so I asked them all at the end of the competition season last weekend. I said like, out of all the time in your life, you know, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, when do you think is the best time to compete now that you have this knowledge? And honestly, most of them said your late 30s, early 40s. And I'm like, wow, a surprise. I thought you'd say, you know, your early 20s. And they said no, because, you know, you, you get to figure out who you are a little bit. You've had your kids. You're like kind of ready to do something for yourself. You And so they were looking more at the process, the journey and not like, oh, in the early 20s, obviously, you're going to look better. They talked about wow, the character skills and like the time of life that you're in in your late 30s is probably perfect to take on something like this. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I I really do love that because that's like doing something for you, especially if you have kids, focusing on on yourself and like setting that goal for yourself, I I think would be so beautiful and so good for your self-development at that point in your life. I definitely want to talk about having kids and you have two, two young ones. I... I'm so curious, how was it for you kind of going through getting pregnant the first time, maybe even the second time, and like watching your body change in a completely different way for the first time? Oh, yes. So I struggled, like I said, to get pregnant the first time. So when it was time, I was actually really ready. I'm like, 
give me the belly, give me the ass, give me the stretch marks. I don't care. I'm completely ready to surrender to this. I had lost two babies on the process to getting pregnant for the third time. I was just ready. And so I had come out of a show in 2019, my last competition. I went on stage at about 127 pounds. I'm five foot nine. So I'm a tall girl. So I went on stage about 127 pounds. I gave birth at 206 pounds. (laughs) So that's a big swing of weight in a year. Right. But like I said, I was ready. I was like, let's do the damn thing. Then post baby, I was like, let's, let's work this off. This is my job. I'm a coach. I help people transform. And over the course of, you know, nine to 10 months, I was back to, I want to say my show weight, but pretty dang close. Like I was getting the physique I was very happy with, finally feeling like myself, finally able to maybe like do a box jump or bring out my skipping rope again. I did all the pelvic floor physiotherapy. I was ready to rock and roll. And I was actually casted for a reality television show. So my husband and I were revving up to go on this reality television show. So that was another motivator to like get this weight off of me, get as fit as heck, learn how to drive a standard. I was doing all the things, Canadian history. And I went in for my medical to leave on this reality television show. And the producers of the show told me I failed my medical exam. I couldn't believe it. What do you mean? I'm healthy. I have no, there's no reason that, am I going to die? Do I have a chronic illness? No, you're eight weeks pregnant. (laughs) Whoa, no. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I was not ready the second time to surrender, to embrace, to gain weight again. I'm like, I just got it off. I'm finally feeling myself. I had these goals, these ambitions. I was going on TV. It's like, what do you mean? My second pregnancy was very hard for me. I was like, I'm just going to keep doing everything I'm doing. I don't want to surrender to this. Like, I don't want to gain the weight. I'm still going to eat healthy. And I I didn't gain nearly as much weight the second time. Also, because I was chasing after like a one-year-old the whole time. I was like walking on my hip the majority of my pregnancy. So, I mean, the second pregnancy was a lot harder body image wise, even though on the scale, I probably, I don't know, I maybe gained 30 pounds, not freaking 70 (laughs) in comparison to the first. (laughs) Wow. Was it Amazing Race Canada that you were going to go on? Huh. I'm not allowed to say, but that's okay. a good guess. I, okay. <laughs> I, had to, I had to sign NDAs and all that jazz. So I'm like, I don't know. Like I, even on my podcast, I always say reality television show. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. I, I love that you shared that. I recently, so I'm 35 weeks right now with my first pregnancy and have gained way more weight than I thought I would gain. I'm 5'9 as well, like always been slim my entire life. Never like bodybuilder slim. Well, like, yeah, never that much muscle or anything. But anyway, and so I recently did a podcast episode on my second trimester experience about gaining weight before my belly popped and like how it was weird to be like flabby. I don't know what other word to use, like, you know, to see fat on your body for the first time, but I didn't look pregnant. And it really messed with my mental health for about like six weeks or so until my belly popped. And then, and then you're like, okay, I'm pregnant. I'm cute pregnant now. Like I can dress up the belly and like I have boobs and like all of these things. And I actually got a bunch of women who responded who said like, thank you so much for sharing that because very similar, like kind of like you, like they've either been in fitness or they've always been healthy And pregnancy has been the first time they've ever really gained weight in their life. And they're like, I don't know how to deal with this. Like, I don't know how to make, like, I'm happy I'm pregnant, but it's also really hard for me to accept this. And then my clothes don't fit. And so I just like, I love that you took such a positive approach after your pregnancy to like get healthier and get moving and like work towards, you know, a healthier body again. But I also know that like bounce back culture is like super toxic. So I don't know if you have anything to say about that, potentially women who are going through postpartum right now and like how you might encourage them. Oh, okay. Well, I'm like, I wish I would prepare for this question because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Cause I, I, when people look at me, they probably are like, okay, well, screw you. You're the reason why we have bounce back culture because I'm not going to lie to you. As soon as my baby was out, I was freaking back in the gym, lifting the weights, eating in a calorie deficit, like that was important to me. But that is my job. That is my lifestyle. That is my passion. I love to lift weights. I love to run. It is something that I would do whether I looked a certain way or not. So I always try to 
relate that to someone where it's like, if you told me all of a sudden I have to learn a second language or I have to learn an instrument postpartum, that might be how it feels for you to have to get to the gym every day or follow a program because that's my passion. So whatever your passion is, maybe it's dance. Maybe it is learning another language. Maybe you play the freaking flute, whatever it is. That's probably easy for you to do. If you like to paint, painting postpartum wouldn't feel that hard. So for me, I love to lift weights. I love to run. I love to eat freaking salads. And so for me, that wasn't hard. And so I, I, but it doesn't discount that it is really hard for other people. And knowing that it doesn't have to be an hour in the gym and lifting weights and on a treadmill, that postpartum fitness can look like going outside with your freaking stroller for a walk, joining a baby mama fitness group, doing aqua fit. It doesn't have to be the same way that it is for fitness influencers or people like me who really, really enjoy that type of lifestyle. Introducing Glycanage, the ultimate biological age test that helps you discover, measure, and optimize your health. With Glycanage, understanding your body has never been simpler or more scientific. Glycanage is more than just a number. It's a comprehensive analysis of your biological age determined by measuring chronic inflammation in your system, a direct result of your lifestyle choices. The test, which is backed by over 30 years of scientific research, and validated by over 200,000 tests, gives you insights published in world-renowned medical journals. Getting started is super easy. The at-home test includes everything you need. Simply collect your sample and send it right back. And in just three weeks, the lab will analyze your sample and generate a detailed report on your biological age. They don't just stop there though. Each glycan age test includes a free consultation with one of their experts. They'll help you understand your results and suggest lifestyle changes to enhance your health and longevity. Glycanage is unique. It responds to lifestyle interventions, unlike other aging clocks. Whether it's through caloric restriction or weight loss or any other healthy habit you might bring in, there are studies that show that these beneficial health changes really can make a difference in your glycan aging. Are you ready to take control of your health? You can use my code biohackingbrittany at checkout for a 15% off discount on your glycan age test. Discover your true biological age with glycan age and start optimizing your life today. Yeah, I love that. And I think that was a perfect answer. Something that I will add, and actually my, my therapist told me this like forever ago, and she did this after her first kid, was instead of focusing on this idea of oh, I just want my body to be back to normal or how it was before I became pregnant. What she did was she signed up for, I think it was a half marathon. And I think it was about like 14 months or so, maybe a year after she had her first baby. And she said, that's what I focused on. So I had this goal. And then by the time the goal came around, I was in the shape that I wanted to be in, that I was very similar or the exact same to how I was before having a baby. But it wasn't like the focus wasn't, oh, let me go back to who I was. It was, let me focus on this new physical goal. And then she did the race and she's like, she did the race with the stroller. And she was like, it was so cool because it just became this marker of like, this is who I am now. This is what I do. And that's what I, I'm probably going to do something similar because I think that's a healthier way for me to mentally go through it. And I would kind of encourage people to do similar. Like set a performance-based goal. And the thing is, when people think about their postpartum body, they never consider that it will be better. They only consider that the best case scenario after having a baby is getting back to where you were before you had one. Have you ever thought of the fact that you can be in the best shape of your life after having kids? Appreciate your body more than you ever have feel more empowered, be more confident because that is an option as well. And I feel like people just put that one off the table. Like, obviously, I'm not going to be better than when I before I had kids. The option is either I'm going to be the same or worse. Like, And so I had a little hashtag during my postpartum journey as I always said, bounce forward. So I'm not fast. I'm bouncing forward. I'm actually becoming a new person. And it can be better than ever before. And better doesn't mean no stretch marks. And better doesn't mean tighter ass. Better can be a lot of different things. Better cardiovascular fitness, better like lower resting heart rate. You know, there's a lot of ways to measure being a better, healthier version of yourself that has nothing to do with a side-by-side photo. Nice. Oh, I love that. I just wrote that down. Bounce forward. (laughs) I think, yeah, I think that's such a good idea. 
So how has your second postpartum period been after your second child? <laughs> well, because it was an unexpected pregnancy, that the pregnancy itself was a little bit harder. I was coming out of running a gym during COVID. So I actually, my husband went on paternity leave with our second daughter, which was really hard for us. He did not want to do that. And I didn't want that. So I wanted to be at home being that nurturing person. But the way our business worked and the way our life worked at that time, it only made sense for me to continue working. So like I got to breastfeed her for six weeks. That's it. And it was like, well, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm working. And he didn't want to be home. That's not who he is as a person either. And so that was really, really hard for us. Nothing to do with like obviously lack of sleep and having two kids under two isn't easy, but it was more the dynamics of we weren't prepared to have our lifestyle shift in that way. I wasn't prepared to be working, you know, right postpartum. I had a home birth with my daughter, which thank God birth went exactly the way that I wanted it to. That was so empowering for me. And I think if I would have had a worse birth, I would have had an even harder postpartum. I think I was reveling in like the adrenaline and the happiness of my birth plan coming to fruition for a while. <laughs> that kept me high for a while. I still just love talking about it. Home birth was absolutely amazing. Wow. I love that. I, well, I mean, it sounds like a difficult journey that you and your husband went through for sure. But I also love that you did a home birth because I'm planning a home birth and it's super important to me. So I have like a midwife and I have a yep. doula and there's many reasons why I want a home birth, which is like beyond the scope of this episode. But I'm so happy to hear about a positive birth experience too, because I just, and I can't wait to share mine. I will share mine regardless, whatever happens, because I think that's important, but it is so encouraging to hear like, you can have a really great home birth and it is possible. And it's not all like gloom and doom that uh, kind of like what you see online or what people put out there. And I didn't tell many people I was having a home birth because I started to. Like I started to, I was like probably seven or eight months pregnant. I'm like, yeah, like this is what I'm planning. I really wanted this with my first. And because we had a high risk pregnancy, multiple miscarriages, I had a subchorionic hematoma. I was put on pe like bed rest. I had a bunch of shit going on the first baby. So that was off the table. This time, however, I'm like, no, this is my redemption birth. Like I'm doing this. But so many people had negative feedback for me. Aren't you, what's going to go wrong? Wouldn't you feel bad if something happened? And I'm like, I can't take those thoughts. If I go into this birth with that much anxiety, I'm not going to get through this. And so I started telling people, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, we're going to the hospital. Yeah, we're going to the hospital. Even my husband. Yeah, pack the hospital bag. We're going to the hospital. And then by the time my water broke and I was at home, I'm like, just so you know, all the home birth stuff's in the closet. We're staying here. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Good for well, you. The pool set up because it technically on file was an unplanned, unplanned home birth, but it was planned in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you just do it by yourself or did you have like a doula or anybody there with you? I had my midwife there. Nice. Okay. Yeah, two midwives and they were phenomenal. I actually interviewed them on my podcast about my home birth. And then I did a home birth episode myself. Cause I was like, I just want to share this experience with people because kind of like, if you go like on reviews, like you look at Expedia or you're looking at Google reviews, usually they're either five stars or one star, you know, like people be experienced and want to say something. But like, I had an amazing experience. And I want to share that too. So I thought, you know, more people need to hear positive birth experiences. And like, if I had known what birth was, I never would have been scared. And I remember growing up my whole life being like, I'm gonna have to do that one day. Oh my god, my body's gonna have to do that. And now I'm like, wow, I spent so many years worried about having to do that. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna go listen to your episode today. <laughs> after this on my walk because yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm so curious to hear about everything that you went through and everyone listening, especially all the pregnant mamas, like go listen to that just to hear like positive birth stories. I think is so good to like put into your brain, you know, get these ideas flowing and know that it's possible really. Oh, uh, well. Yeah. I think that's so important. And I think that's so beautiful. A yeah. A, yeah. I just love that. And I like, congratulations on <laughs> having such a successful birth. Now that you have, you know, two kids and you've gone through your second postpartum period where you're kind of still going through it, but what kind of personal habits and health routines do you find are so crucial to you right now with like such a busy life and a busy business? Great question. I have a little slogan for myself, a little mantra called finding 40. So we kind of talked at the beginning of the episode, like, oh, my mom would get an hour or whatever. For me, it's 40 minutes. I created a home gym in my garage because I wanted to be able to do something I mean, five or six days a week. That's what makes me healthy. Like I said, I love lifting weights. I love running. 
And so my kids, I have a Thule. It's my favorite jogging stroller. So my kids know. I mean, yeah, you can have a downloaded iPad show and a Welch's fruit snack and we're going for a run. So like I force fitness for 40 minutes a day. That's something, whether my kids are with me, whether it's during their nap time, whatever. I don't go to a big box gym very often unless I can carve out that time, but it's not an expectation. When I wake up in the morning, I'm not like, when can I get to the gym today? I'm just like, okay, when can I find that 40 minutes? Whether it's I'm bringing my weights inside and I'm doing it in the living room because it's freezing outside or I'm putting my gas freaking fireplace on in my unheated garage and I'm going out there at five o'clock in the morning with two monitors while my kids sleep. Finding that 40 minutes is like probably my biggest habit. And it's something I've been able to do through both postpartums and beyond. And then in terms of like, I wish I could sit here and be like, I meal prep every Sunday, but that's something I encourage other people to do. In terms of my nutrition, I always just make sure I protein because protein for moms is the hardest thing. We're always grabbing the carbs and the fats and the crust off our kids' plates or the couple grapes that dropped on the floor. Like that's how moms feed themselves. And so just having like chicken breast made or like cans of tuna or deli meat or beef jerky or pre-made protein shakes or a protein powder I really love or protein bars or like at least protein available. I know that that's usually people's Achilles heel. It keeps you satiated. It helps with recovery and a repair. It's good for your metabolism. It has a high thermic effect of food, all of these positive things. So for me, focusing on protein and ensuring I get my 40 minutes have been the biggest things when it comes to like my own health and fitness. And then as a biohacker, I'm so into cold plunging and cold showers and saunas. So like hyperthermic and hypothermic conditioning, like I'm talking almost on a daily basis, at least 11 minutes a week of cold therapy. And then I'm probably in my sauna for about two hours in total a week of like hot yoga, hot stretching. I'm so here for it. Oh, I love everything that you just said. And I think it's so important. Um, What type of sauna do you have and what type of cold plunge or do you just use cold showers? So right now I'm doing cold showers, but I have done like a horse trough full of ice kind of dealio. I would like to like invest in the cold, nice cold plunge outside though. I mean, I, I just need to prove myself I was going to do it. And I've done it almost every single day since July 1st of last year. So I'm like, okay, I think I've created the habit now. And then I have an infrared sauna. Nice. Oh, good. That's great. Yeah, we, um, we're building a home gym. We just moved into a new house and we're building a home gym right now. And I'm lining up a sauna for the fall. It's kind of tough right now, like being so pregnant anyway, (laughs) but it's actually super important for me postpartum is to have that because it's so good for you physically and mentally, the endorphins. It's like you're in your, you know, sympathetic. Oh my gosh. Like listen to my baby brain. You're in your calm zone, but you're still sweating at the same time. Parasympathetic. There you go. And it's really hard to get that by doing anything else really. So But like you said, like you can also do yoga and stretch in there and saunas are like easily one of my favorite biohacks. So I love that you are incorporating that. I'm absolutely obsessed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Does your husband kind of join you with all of this as well? I mean, yes and no. He used to own our gym with me pre-COVID. And so we were a little bit more like a fitness couple. And then he's pursued like obviously a different career. He's not into fitness and he's not like he's into fitness, but he's not in the fitness industry every single day, running a gym, being a trainer, you know, owning a facility. And so like he'll jump in the sauna and he'll definitely do the cold. He works out, but like his job is a lot more active than mine. Like I'm sitting right now in my desk and I'm going to be here till three o'clock this afternoon. And it's only 948 in the morning. So like I sit a lot. And so getting in that 40 minutes of movement, doing my stretching, getting my cold plunge, like I'm also a little bit bigger on like managing anxiety and managing my nervous system. I'm like all about nervous system regulation. He's not as much into that. He's not an anxious little guy like me. (laughs) So I'm like, I want to make sure that my nervous system comes first always. And a lot of times cold really helps with that. Saunas really help with that. And ironically, postpartum, I had a hard time with my milk supply. And bringing my breast pump into the sauna and kind of like massaging my boobs helped my milk come in. (gasps) Wow. Okay. That's a (laughs) hack. I need to write that down. Just because your body is warm, kind of like if you're heading into a workout, right? You warm up your muscles, blood to the muscle, more vasodilation. I don't know, but it did something for me. That's such a, that's so interesting. Oh, I'm going to have to test that theory and see how that works. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So when you're kind of coping with anxiety and, and trying to manage it, what, I mean, sauna and cold is like phenomenal for that, obviously. But beyond that, what are your other like favorite go-to strategies? Breath work, definitely. Huge fan. I actually even incorporate breath work and down regulation breathing into my training plans. And people are like, what the hell? Like I have to do the Stairmaster for six minutes and then I have to 
put a timer on for three minutes and do, you know, two minute inhales and five minute exhales or like whatever the assignment is. Like, yes, because like down regulating your body after a workout and not leaving in a like a you just do hit sprints, then you walk out the door, your body is not regulated, your nervous system is not regulated. So it's good to like, calm that body, calm that nervous system, it helps with recovery, it helps with repair of your muscle mass. And it re- like, this isn't just me saying this The research has shown when people down regulate before they leave the gym, they have better recovery, repair and muscle growth. So I mean, maybe I tangent on that a little bit. But that's something the, the breathing piece. And I would love to say like, I meditate for 30 minutes a day, I still have a hard time being in a meditative state, but I keep practicing. And I think meditation is a practice just like yoga. It's not something that's ever perfected, but it's something I'm still working on. I love that. So smart. Such a good idea. And actually breath work, practicing breath work is really great for pregnancy and for birth because I've been working with my doula. Not that I've been through birth yet. You know, listen to me, give advice. <laughs> but yeah, but what I, when I've worked together with my my midwife, my doula, and I had a public floor physiotherapist, we were doing breath work together. And it was actually really easy for me to kind of tap into that breath because I've been doing it in different ways through biohacking, through all these different things. So there is that connection there that you can kind of learn to lengthen, release the pelvic floor with your breath that can really make a difference during birth as well. Yeah, really like a lot of those like deep alms. Like, oh, I was, I sounded like that during birth a lot. Uh, Not really like, ah, ah like that high pitch like think if you scream like that ah think about what like what happens to your pelvic floor and like your vagina when you do that yeah it tightens right so like seeing that low vibration oh opening the cervix all the arms you'll do fantastic yeah 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 I, oh i was gonna ask did you try the hypnobirthing app like have you heard those meditations i i've listened to some on spotify but i didn't know there was an app so maybe i should look into that so well, that's the one I, I did a lot of induction acupuncture because I really didn't want to get induced. Obviously, I wanted a like medical free birth. And so I went on my due date. I was like, I need to get this baby out soon because I do not want to get induced. And I did induction acupuncture treatments like for this, like multiple times leading up to her birth. And during that, I would listen to those hypnobirthing meditations. And it really helped me when I was in actual labor. Amazing. Okay, I just wrote that down. I'm going to look into that. And I have been doing acupuncture. I did acupuncture for before I was pregnant and during pregnancy. And so, because yeah, like you said, like it can actually really help with induction, especially if you go over. And it's so interesting. Like there's actually so much that you can do to support you that like you don't have to, you know, do these quick fixes of like going to the hospital or anything like that. You just have to kind of like learn about it. A hundred percent. And like, I mean, there's always the result of like, that can still happen. You can do everything right. Drink all the freaking tea, eat all the dates, do everything right, and still end up in the hospital with an emergency C-section. Like that still happens to people. So I, I, I could see how that would totally, well, I don't want to use the word trauma as like just a regular word in a sentence, but I can definitely see as someone who had that vision, I needed the skin to skin. I needed the golden hour. I needed delayed cord clamping. I needed to freaking see my placenta. Like I had a birth plan. And if it didn't go to plan, like I could see how that would be very difficult. I also just not the best person to talk on it, but should be a voice of reason of like, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. Like there's, you can do all the preparation and things can still go awry. And that's like just life and that's part of it. And my thing is, is like, just be as educated as you can so that you know, so you're informed when you're making the decisions in the moment. And that's true with anything, not just birth, like, you know, especially in the health world. But This has been such a great discussion. If people want to work with you or reach out to you, maybe get trained by you, how can they find you and how can they connect? Oh, well, Instagram is usually my main hub. My company's name is Perfect Fit For You. P-E-R-F-E-C-T number four letter U. So you can find us on Instagram at that. That's my company. And then also we have a website. Myself, personally, I go by Authentically Ashlyn. That's the name of my podcast. You can find it on Apple. You can find it on Spotify, anywhere you get your podcast. And that is also my Instagram handle. So at Authentically Ashlyn. And then I put an underscore at the end because somebody already had that username. And you'll see it's a picture of me, hot pink background, some sunnies on with a bunch of Aperol spritz in my face because that's just my vibe. (laughs) Okay, perfect. I will link that in the show notes and on my website so people can easily find you. I'll link your podcast and socials as well, obviously. 
Thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. And it's been very encouraging and inspiring. And I just loved it. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to watching how everything unravels for you and hopefully hearing your birth story in the near future. Yeah, yeah. I will definitely be sharing the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Brittany. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.